Hey everyone, this is Dr. Tucker and we're going to talk about parasites and horses tonight. The horse talk is part of the equine practices, the horse's advocate. And parasites is just such an important topic and I'm glad all of you can be here tonight to check it out. I will apologize up front that I forgot my microphone. So hopefully my acoustics are going to be okay. I really won't know until I'm done. But maybe if some of you out there could just let me know if the, um, the, if the uh, iPhone's working well, just let me know. And let me see, I'm going to do something real quick. There we go. All right, welcome. Uh, the format of the, these horse talks are, are, I'm trying to keep the same. This is basically the same format as I had last month when I talked about colic in horses. I give you a brief overview. I'll talk about the horse's advocate. I'll talk about the worldwide webcast, and then I'll figure out why the heck I'm going to talk about parasites. So, <clears throat> first thing you need to know is that a recording of this webinar will be available for free to everyone for a limited time and forever to members of the Horses Advocate. So consider at the end of this becoming Horses Advocate and learning a little bit more about horses and all aspects. So, the webinar is going to flow logically in these topics. I'm going to go over the basics. What are parasites? Why are parasites an important part of husbandry? The detection of parasites, the medical treatments, the prevention, and some take-home points and questions. Now, honestly, I do this all the time when I go to calls when I'm talking to uh, clients about when I'm doing their horse's teeth, and I find that it just rolls off my tongue in a very logical way, and hopefully I'll, I'll be able to present it tonight this way so you'll, you'll figure it all out. All right, what is a horse's advocate? It's a website that I've put together. It's part of the equine practice, and I teach horse owners to become an advocate for their horse living in a human world. So I like to simplify things down to the fundamentals because once you get the fundamentals, then you're going to be knowledgeable. And, of course, knowledge is power, and I think that's an important part of owning a horse, being knowledgeable so you can communicate with your veterinarians and fellow horse people. I like worldwide webcast. Some people call them webinars, uh, but it is definitely worldwide. Anybody in the world can listen to this. This is taking place in South Florida, and a lot of this information is about Florida horses, but it also is about any horse anywhere in the world. So I want to get into deeper discussion of the subject, and I'm going to have uh, questions you know, from you guys that I'll be able to answer. I've got my son here, Matt, who's monitoring all the um, – questions and answers and we'll try and get to them as they come along. I have my wife Kathy here who's also monitoring and making sure that things are coming through really well and that she can hear everything. Okay, why talk about parasites? Well, I want horse, horse owners to understand parasites and the horse and discuss it in a simplified and fundamental way and keeping it simple will help your understanding. Now, I've got to admit, some of it's a little complicated. But I think you're going to find by the end of this webinar, I'm going to take some of these complicated ideas and break them down into something that even a caveman can understand. Sorry to borrow it from that advertisement that's so popular, but uh, <clears throat> sometimes a lot of people try to overcomplicate things. As a veterinarian, I find that most horse owners don't understand parasites, their life cycles, their abundance, their persistence in the environment, the damage done to the horse, and most importantly, how they can protect their own horses from them. And I just want to educate you. All right, here's the mandatory who am I, and that's me sitting next to a retired dressage horse that is very famous, um, and he and I are really best buds. Uh, but I've been a horseman since 1973 and a veterinarian, graduating from Cornell um, in 1984. And many uh, horses that I've seen uh, have had parasites, and I have abundant stories that I could talk to you about parasites, and I'll probably – just sprinkle them in throughout this because I am a storyteller and I am a photographer. Now, if you guys are sitting there with a little bit of your dinner in front of you, this next picture is going to be the only gross picture I've got. So if you don't like gross pictures, don't look, but here it comes. Three, two, one. All right, this is a parasite that is in a fecal ball that landed on the floor of a farm that I was at, um, and I couldn't help but just take a picture of it. Uh, these are roundworms, ascarids, uh, very popular in some horses, especially young horses, and they can become so abundant that they can clog the intestines and actually kill the horse. 
um, the fact that you're seeing a whole ascarid is usually not a concern for alarm, but if you see several of them, then you definitely have something to be alarmed about. But I want to get into the basics of parasites. I like to divide them into external and internal. And then I'll also talk about the signs of parasitism in your horse. So let's start with the external parasites. Any parasite that lives their entire lives outside of the horse but needs the horse to complete their life cycle is an external parasite. Lice is a great example of that. <laughs> I think that's an air horn that just blew outside, but don't worry about that. Anyway, um, there, there are a bunch of opportunistic infections that are not external parasites, such as ticks, mites, bacteria, and fungus. And they often get confused as an external parasite, but they're not. So lice are usually found in immunocompromised horses. Those are horses that are stressed, either through overcrowding, starving, internal parasites overload, uh, freezing cold temperatures, no protection from the wind. And you just take a look at them, and you know right away that they're not doing well. They're unthrifty. Their hair coat looks um, uh, dull uh, and, and lifeless. And if you part the hair coat, you're going to see the small, slender white lice moving about the skin like moving grains of sand, uh, pardon me, of rice. And if you've never seen it before, the first time you do, you're just going to drop your jaw because you're going to say, oh my goodness, I can't believe these things are crawling all over my horse. And they're usually very itchy. They have a raw mane and chest and face. And the treatment for lice is, first and foremost, remove the cause of stress. That's so important. Get these horses warm, get them sheltered, get them uncrowded, uh, make them feel whole again. That's so important. And then deworm these horses once a week for three weeks with ivermectin. And the reason why I chose ivermectin is when these lice bite the horse, they're going to get the dose of ivermectin and die. But the problem is the eggs on the hair haven't hatched yet, and they'll be hatching all throughout the next seven days. And that's why you do them again with ivermectin. And then three weeks later, you do them again. And if you cleaned up the environment and made the horse healthy again, then you should be able to have covered all the uh, egg hatching. Uh, now, lice, just thinking about it, you're probably scratching your head right now, just thinking about it. But the lice of horses won't affect humans, uh, but they will affect other horses. So if one has it, then there's probably multiple horses on the farm that have it. The eggs are specific for attaching the hair shaft of the horse. So the lice of a, uh, of a horse can get on you and crawl around, but as he tries to lay an egg, there's no hair shaft that it can attach to, and so that egg dies. So you can't carry that on. Lice are very species-specific. But I don't have any pictures of lice. I just haven't come across a case in so long, probably in about 30 years since I last see my last case. Um, but here's uh, insect sens sensitivity along the mane of a horse, and you see how a lot of it is uh, worn away, and this is typical of lice. You'll see, especially in the uh, crusty parts of the mane, where the mane attaches to the horse, you'll peel that apart and look between the hairs, and you actually see these things moving. Here's uh, some more itching on the chest, and here, of course, is the tail head, and you peel these apart, and you just see the lice just going to town. Yes, you can give the horse a bath and get rid of all the lice that's on there. Uh, usually, if you're up in the north, it's cold because you see a lot of this in cold weather, and it's kind of hard to give them a bath in. So the best thing you do is give them that dose of ivermectin. And whenever you give ivermectin or any chemical to your horse or any medicine, be sure you go dose it at least as much as the horse weighs because if you underdose, if you only give 1,000 pounds to a 1,200-pound horse, it will not be effective. Just remember that. Here's a couple other opportunistic infections. There's a tick. I don't know if you can see it over there in the uh, upper right-hand corner, but I, I took that tick off, and there it is on the palm of my hand. Ticks can carry a lot of diseases. We all know about Lyme disease being the biggest one here in the United States, uh, and we have to watch out for them. So whenever you see a tick, you want to make sure you get it off uh, completely. But that's not truly a parasite because this tick doesn't need the horse to live. Here's a case of rain rot. Rain rot is bacterial infection, again, an immunosuppressed horse. If you see rain rot, there's also a chance that they have lice, but it's, it's caused by bacteria. You can see it on his face here and on the rump here. It creates raw crusts and scabs, um, but I find that these immunocompromised horses, if you deworm once a week for three weeks with ivermectin, you can take care of most of this rain rot uh, without doing too much else other than some betadine baths. 
And here's a case of ringworm in a horse. Uh, you just see these round patches on the face, and this is a fungus. Again, it, you don't see this except in immunocompromised horses, um, which lice can be on, but a fungus is not a external parasite. It's just an opportunistic. So I think it covered external parasites pretty well. Um, so let's slip on to these internal parasites. Any parasite that lives a portion of their lives within the horse is an internal parasite. And there are many varieties of helminths, and I wanted to use the word helminths because it's probably the only time in my life I'll say the word helminths. But that includes all the parasites that are internal in horses. There's, uh, it, it's not specific for a certain type, but somebody call them helminths, and that's what it is. They include the small strong giles, the large strong giles, roundworms, such as askers like we saw on that ball of feces, and tapeworms. Bots are not helminths, but they're fly larvae that pass through the digestive tract of the horse, so they definitely are an internal parasite. They require the horse for their life cycle. And the reason I use the word helminths is because a lot of you might have seen anthelmintics, and some people spell it A-N-T-I-H-E-L, anti-helmintics, but the, con the common way of saying it is anthelmintics, and those are the drugs used against the helminths. I thought that might be something interesting for a lot of you to know. Signs of internal parasites basically are unthriftiness, dull hair coat. Uh, I like to talk about worm hairs. I'll show you some pictures of worm hairs in a second. I put them in quotes because they're that's my words. Uh, weight loss, uh, ewe neck, E-W-E is a female uh, sheep, and we call it a ewe neck, and I'll show you a picture of that. Uh, poor performance and a positive fecal egg count. And if you just remember, fecal egg count is F-E-C. I'll use those abbreviations in a little bit. Uh, but these are some of the things that come through, and I want to talk to you about this um, a little bit more. Let me show you some pictures first. These are worm hairs. What you're seeing here in sharp focus are long hairs that are sticking out the bottom side of the neck of a horse. If you go down to the bottom here, that's the chest, and you go up here, that's heading toward the throat latch. And these hairs, you just grab, you can pinch them between your fingers, Here's some more. See how long and stringy these hairs are? These aren't the regular hairs of the long hair coat, but just really long hairs. And what's interesting is both these horses that I just showed you, these pictures were taken in June. And in June, they should not have a long hair coat like this. These horses weren't shedding. But it's these long hairs that you grab between your fingers and you pull, and these horses hate that. See these worm hairs up above my hand? You grab them and you pull. The horses don't like it. They're not coming out. If you deworm, deworm your horse once a week for three weeks with ivermectin, all these worm hairs will fall out. It's just an amazing process to see because the horse is just so unthrifty, he's not even trying to get rid of these things. Here's a horse with a dull hair coat. Um, you can... This horse also had some of these worm hairs, but they're hard to see. This neck that curves in just at the withers, it kind of drops down. That's what's called a U neck. And uh, when you see a U neck and when you see uh, unthrifty dull hair coat and worm hairs, you're pretty positive that this horse has a parasite problem. But what's really interesting is a lot of these guys that look this way will have a zero egg count. And you'll take another fecal from the horse that's shiny and looks great on your farm, and they'll have a positive fecal egg count. And basically, the horse that's getting rid of the parasites and getting them out of their system usually stays a little bit healthier. And the horse that is internalizing them and getting unthrifty, that's the horse that has a parasite problem you need to worry about. I want to talk about bots uh, before I move on to the fecal egg count. Uh, <clears throat> You'll probably see bot fly larvae. On the right side, you can see them closely attached to the hairs. And on the left side, this is a further away shot of the same leg. Now, what's really interesting about bot flies is their life cycle, which I'm going to get into in a little bit. Fecal egg counts. A lot of people are proposing fecal egg counts. And there's a, a horse once that... Um, they were having a high egg count. They were deworming the horses every six to eight weeks, and their egg count was coming back at 2,000 eggs per gram of feces. Now, a lot of you are, are in the English system, so you don't know what um, eggs per gram of feces are, so let's just turn that over to pounds. There's 450 grams to a pound. 
So just for math's sake, let's just round that up to 500 grams. So if you multiply 500 grams times 2,000 eggs, that's basically a million eggs per pound of horse poop. So a 2,000 egg count is just extremely high. So let's get into this uh, life cycle thing. A horse ingests an infective third-stage larvae that's just attached to a blade of grass that's on the ground of an infected pasture. The larvae penetrate the gut wall and migrate using a specific path. For instance, ascaris will migrate down through the liver, and small strongyles will insist along the intestinal tract. Large strongyles will actually cause uh, damage to the mesenteric artery as they pass up the um, artery from the guts to the aorta and then back down. I uh, don't know why they go up there and turn around and come back. Uh, you know, nobody knows why these parasites do what they do, but they create damage as they go along. Uh, these cysts are basically fluid-filled sacs that are in the lining of the gut. They're hard to see except with a microscope, but the larvae hang out in there. Some migrate outside the wall causing peritonitis, and this is really common because with increasing daylight that you get in the northern hemisphere between January and March, these parasites are triggered to be released from their cysts and they start to migrate and come out in the feces. But there's a lot of horses where the, the, the parasite load is high and we have what's called an aberrant or meaning a misdirected parasite migration and it actually penetrates the gut wall and it sets up what's called a peritonitis or inflammation the lining of the gut. And all of a sudden, the, the horse owner is confronted with a horse that's sick, it has a fever of about 102. There's nothing really specific. They're not colicky. There's no reason why. Nobody understands it. But I'll guarantee you, most of these horses, put them on some antibiotics and some pain reliever to reduce the, the fever. But deworm those guys once a week for three weeks. If you did a fecal egg count, they'll probably come back positive. Uh, but that's a aberrant migration. Uh, and, and conversely, I jumped ahead here, sorry, but the decreasing daylight causes the parasites to stay in the host. The whole idea behind the parasites is they want to get inside where it's warm, where they can do really well during the winter, and then they can pass out in the springtime. It's the increasing, decreasing daylight that triggers that. Now, when they come out in the spring, the adult will start laying eggs, and it's the eggs that are counted in the feces. And when the eggs hit the ground, uh, they'll develop into the first and second stage larvae. These are non-infective. Uh, and that's important to know because it's something I'm going to tell you in a little bit. But in about three days, they get to the third stage larvae, and that's the infective larvae. That's the ones that, once they eat the third stage larvae, those are the ones that will survive the digestive juices and will start to uh, complete their life cycle. And you're right back to the beginning again. Uh, it's interesting to note that the larvae can actually crawl up the dew-laden grass in the morning uh, waiting to be eaten. And as the sun comes up and the dew dries up, the uh, larvae will crawl down uh, the grass to get to the moist part of the earth. So if you have a parasite-ridden pasture uh, and there's no way to clean it up, don't turn your horses out when the dew is up. Wait till the sun comes up and the pasture dries if, if you've got a problem with parasites uh, on your property. Now, this is really important prevention. Um, this bull here represents uh, the worm, and it's just going to land on this guy um, and just annihilate him, which is what parasites can do. They're just poised and ready to pounce, and we have to stop that. We have to create a, a, a way that we can prevent this from happening so your horses can remain healthy. And the best way to do that is create a good, healthy environment. I can't emphasize that enough, uh, and I'll go into that uh, ad nauseum for you guys. Uh, deworming using medicines or other chemicals or non-chemical methods is a secondary way that you can take care of them. They're all effective to some degree, but they're not as good as keeping the environment clean. And then you can monitor your program with a fecal egg count, uh, although I think that is something that doesn't work well, which is not in lockstep with what is being told you now. If you go to a lot of the uh, articles that are out there, or seminars, uh, or you talk to your veterinarians, everyone's doing an FEC, and they want to monitor, and when they see a positive egg count, then they're deworming. And to me, that doesn't make sense, because when you see a positive egg count, you already have damage, you already have an unthrifty horse. 
and never did they talk about this first one, create a good healthy environment. They just talked about doing a fake leg count and when they have it, then use the dewormer strategically and they just go between these two things. And I'll tell you why creating a good healthy environment is so important. But first we have to go over the history of anthelmintics. And this is really kind of interesting if you, if you haven't been around for a while, if you're a young person, you have to go back to 1973. That's when I started with working with horses 42 years ago. And the vet, I'll never forget, he came into the barn and he was so excited. He's waving this aluminum foil packet and he announced they now had medicine specifically to combat worms. Up until their point, there was absolutely nothing out there. There's just... Uh, there's teas that people put together, there's uh, chewing tobacco, there's all sorts of things that they use to try and combat worms, but nothing specifically, no medicines. Then about 1980 or 35 years ago, pasty wormers came out and they said this is going to be great because now everybody can just stick the tube, you know, the paste down there. Up until that point, they had uh, stomach tubes. They're actually tubing horses. And all through vet school, I became very good at passing a stomach tube in a horse and passing um, deworming medicines. But these pace really changed the game. 1983, they invented injectable ivermectin. And it killed uh, some helmets, and it also killed the bots, but also, unfortunately, killed a couple of horses. So in 1984, they recalled it, reform reformulated it, and it came out as a liquid that we could drench the horse and also came out as a paste. Then about 22 years ago, a daily feed-through dewormer was introduced to horses. It had been out for about 20 years in, in pigs, and now they formulated it so horses could eat it. And about three years ago, I was at a conference where the scientists and the veterinarians started to publicly mention that we have a resistance problem. And that's where this whole idea of deworming um, strategically only after you have a positive egg count. And that's just because they said there's nobody working on new anthelmetics that they are getting too much resistance and at some point we will not be able to combat these par parasites in horses with the drugs that we've got. So they're using some scare tactics. They keep saying you have to do something strategic and again they're not going to the root of the problem of why horses have parasites which I'll go over in a little bit. <clears throat> when we started there's no strategy. They just keep kept deworming horses with whatever whenever. And then they said, let's rotate between the chemical groups because they started talking about resistance a long time ago. And they didn't want these parasites to become resistant to a specific uh, chemical group. So they started rotating through the different things. And that was, that's what I was taught coming through vet school. Now, it's interesting that the marketing um, of these chemicals determine the frequency of deworming. There's a good scientific study uh, that became fodder for this marketing, which I'll go over in the next couple of slides. The concept of deworming daily was introduced with the daily dewormers um, in the late 80s. And then the concept of strategic deworming using FECs is now what's popular. Again, I'm, I'm just giving this all to you so you could get the history, and then I'm going to kind of open it up and show you what the truth is. This study I love to quote because it was such a good study. They had three groups of ponies and all with a specific number of eggs. They actually, they're all parasite free and they dosed them all with X amount of uh, eggs and they all did an FEC and they all were positive. Every pony in the group were all positive with thousands of eggs coming out in the, in the manure. And they're all turned out into small pastures separated into three groups. Group run, they did nothing. They did the FEC and it slight, slightly diminished over time. And the reason it slightly diminished over time was because the horse has an immune system that's able to take care of some of these things. The horses are fair, fairly healthy, so they lowered it, but it didn't get rid of it. In group two, they deworm chemically every six weeks. And what's really interesting is the FEC always went to zero and then rose again to a high level at six weeks. So in other words, they were at a high level when they started, bam, they got a dewormer, it went down to zero, and they slowly reinfected themselves because they're in a paddock that was, that was dirty. And as they reinfected themselves, about six weeks later, they had an egg count that was high enough that they go ahead and dewormed them again. And in group three, the paddock was vacuumed daily. Yes, there is a vacuum that you can go out there, and I'll show you pictures of several types of vacuums that are out there, to clean up the paddocks. The FEC went to zero and it stayed there for the length of the study. Now that tells me that they were not being reinfected, 
and that their own immune system was able to take care of the parasites that were going through them. What made this study so good was the study was repeated two more times, rotating each pony through each protocol. So the ponies group, group one were moved to two, the group two was moved to three, and group three to one, and then they did the whole study again, so every pony went through all three groups, and they got the same results. Now, the conclusion was deworm your horse every six to eight weeks to reduce the fecal egg count to zero. In other words, wait until there's infection and then treat them. Marketing grabbed this and they thought they could sell this concept. In other words, when you bought a, t um, a tube of dewormer, it said deworm in six to eight weeks. And we as horse owners thought that this was the right thing to do. It became the basis for the treatment protocol that's used by many horse owners still today. But the real conclusion, the one that I saw from this study, was to keep the area clear of parasites. The horse's immune system would take care of the rest. Now, it's really interesting to note that the ascarids, that long white worm that you saw in the fecal ball at the beginning of this talk, those are seen in horses under two years of age. But beyond two years of age, you don't see them in horses. That's because a horse's immune system finally catches up and plays you know, havoc on the ascarid, and the ascarids basically are wiped out. And the only other time you get to see ascrids again are either in very stressed horses or in very old horses, 30, 35, 40 years old, and they're stressed. Just like older people sometimes are more susceptible to disease, you'll see some of these horses get um, these ascrids back, and that's a sure sign that you've got an immune-compromised horse. So the immune system is very effective at taking care of these. So let me show you a picture of a vacuum. I found this vacuum here. This is a four-wheeler obviously pulling. It's got a motor up here that provides suction, and the operator of the four-wheeler just takes this uh, scoop and, and just hovers over the manure, and it's sucked up through this pipe and into this bin, which is dumped later. Here's the, here's the other side of it. You can see the little Honda generator here that provides the suction, and this is a really, really good way of doing things. There's a lot of other units out here. This is the Greystone. I've seen this at several farms. Again, you drag it behind a little lawn tractor, and you've got this engine here that sucks up the, uh, the stuff. Here's another picture of another one at a farm, the long hose, and there's a handle, so they just uh, go around. There are some people actually use these to clean their horse stalls. They just go in there and suck all the manure out in the wet bedding. It's just a very easy way to take care of things. Um, I want to jump ahead. Sorry, this this... Actually, I can do this right here. I'm just going to move right up here. Ha! Uh, go over there. All right, this is a homemade uh, product. Uh, this actually is a leaf blower, and as you know, all leaf blowers have to suck air in. And this, he developed a way that this sucker could go through this big tank, and he made his own manure uh, vacuum pickup. And he drives around in this little electric cart. He's got a a little inverter down here that runs the electric for the leaf blower. And on the Horses Advocate site, uh, someplace I have the whole instructions, the PDF on how to build these and all the equipment that you need. And I think it costs him uh, maybe 300 bucks, not including the electric cart, for him to go out here and suck this thing up. So he thought that was pretty good. But let me show you what a couple other people have done. I was leaving this farm, I think it was in uh, Maryland. I can't remember exactly where it was. And I was blown away. This is the barn driveway, a nice tree lines. And then I saw this fence line. And I saw hanging here on this fence post on the very left-hand side, a snow shovel. And you can see that it's hanging on some nails and it's got a little clip here so it doesn't go anywhere. And if you go down one, two, three fence posts, you see another one. And then you go down a couple more and there's another one and another one. And they have them all along here. And what they do is, here, here's a better view of it. This is the snow shovel. What they do is, is they constantly go in here and look how clean this paddock is. This is beautiful. This is how you prevent parasites. They don't eat where they defecate, basically. And that's how you break the cycle. And these people come out here every day and clean the paddock. This person here has a wheelbarrow and a fork out in the paddock. And here we are in, in working in the stalls. And out here, there's no... There's no um, uh, fecal piles except this one, which she hadn't gotten to yet. Uh, and she'll come out here and pick it up. And it'll go right in this bucket. And remember I said it takes three days to go from uh, the 
L1, the larval first stage and larval ses second stage, to the third larval stage, which is the infective stage. So it takes about three days for the larvae in here to become infected. So if you don't have time to come out here and get this every day, if you can get out here every other day, or at worst case scenario, every third day and get this put into the wheelbarrow, you're going to be way ahead of the game in deworming your horses. So let me ask you a question. I love asking this question. How often did your parents deworm you? Or how often do you deworm yourself or your children? And most people say, what are you talking about? We don't deworm our, our, our kids. Well, the chemicals used in today's uh, horses are approved for use in humans. Ivermectin is approved for use. Uh, here's Reese's pinworm medicine, treatment for pinworms. I found in Walgreens. Here's the Walgreens shelf in the background. I'm holding it. This is parental pamoid suspension. That's strongid tea. That's liquid strongid. And for all of you who have horses, you know what strongid it is. It's been out forever. And this is used for the entire family. And this proves to you that these medicines are for sale over the counter, right there on the shelf at Walgreens. And Ivermectin donated... Uh, several tens of thousands of doses to um, women living in the Amazon region that were getting infected with larvae that actually infected their mammary glands. And it was a very painful death for these women. And ivermectin just stopped in its tracks. So these medicines are really important. But let me talk to you about some other things that have happened in parasites. So this is my storytelling mode. One day I went to a farm and it was getting towards winter. I'd say it was the cold rains of upstate New York, late October, and there was a group of horses. It was overcrowded, way too many horses for the paddock. I'd say there's about 10 or 12 horses for maybe five acres. And this woman was operating on a shoestring. And I took a look at her horses and I said, your horses have parasites. They had the Unix, the unthrifty hair coat, the worm hairs, everything was there. And she says, no, I don't. And I said, well, but but all the signs are there. And they, she said, it can't be. I'm using diatomaceous earth. Now, diatomaceous earth is basically uh, muck taken off the bottom of the ocean floor that's filled with something called diatoms. And diatoms are very small uh, shelled organisms that have died off and left their exoskeleton, their shell there. And horses are fed diatomaceous earth with the thoughts that as it goes down their intestinal system, it actually scrapes the lining and kills um, the uh, parasites in there and cleans them out. And I, I said to her, I'll tell you what, I will um, do one fecal. Just you pick the pile, I'll do it, I'll run it for free. And based on what that is, will you just listen to me? And she says, do whatever you want, doc. So I did, I uh, took the sample in and did the fecal egg count on it and it came back 2,000 eggs per gram of feces. And uh, I, I went to tell her that it was about a million eggs per pound of poop, and she uh, refused to talk to me from that point on. She didn't do anything. I never saw that woman again. Uh, but she was absolutely positive that she didn't want to use any chemicals on the horse, and she's absolutely positive that her diatomaceous earth was doing the deal. But in reality, she had a pigsty for a farm, overcrowded, stressed horses, and these horses weren't doing well. There's nothing I could do to help her. Then there's another story. I was fresh out of vet school, and I was in my uh, first practice, which is right outside of Cornell. And I went to this farm who was diligently deworming, rotating uh, the chemicals she was using between ivermectin, strongid, and uh, a, a basic chemical. I think it was um, Panicure or something like that. And she was doing it every six weeks. And I went to her, and I said, your horses." Are, are loaded with parasites. They look horrible. She says, yes, I know they're horrible. I'm deworming exactly as the package says. And I told her, well, I'm not too sure what's happening because if you're doing exactly what's on the package, there's got to be something else going on. So I asked Dr. Georgie to come from Cornell. He had written the book, some book on parasitite, parasites in all animals. He is world-renowned parasitologist. He just passed away last year. Uh, I'm sorry to hear that he's gone but he came out to help me solve the problem and he walked into the barn and the pasture and he looked around he turned around and he actually punched me in the shoulder I said what is going on why are you punching me he says did you sleep through my class 
And I kind of laughed and I said, well, yeah, I mean, parasites is boring. I, I, the big words about these invisible things that are migrating through animals and doing all this damage. And I just didn't believe it was happening. And so he just rolled his eyes skyward and says, this place is a poop hole. There's nothing but manure everywhere. This horse is eating everywhere where there's manure. They're eating where they defecate. There's your problem. You cannot deworm with enough chemicals to kill this problem without cleaning up the environment the horse is working in. And that was back in 1984, 1985. And that's what they were telling us. We have to clean up the environment. Yet for some reason, here it is, 2015, and that message still hasn't gotten out, which is very frustrating for us. Then there's another story, and this one's a very sad story. But I was working in another practice temporarily, and I was called out uh, to, uh, I was called by a man who said, my horse is sick, it's got some diarrhea, and I need you to take a look at him. I said, how old is the horse? And he said, he's uh, six months. I said, this foal has diarrhea, I'll come out right away. He says, no, no, you can't come out right now. I'm a principal at a high school, and I can't leave until this afternoon, so can you come out this afternoon? I was really concerned, so I said to him, do me a favor, please call your wife at home and ask her how the horse is doing, and then I will work from there. So he did, and I got a phone call back just not too much later, and he was in tears. He said that the foal was dead. Now, he had had another veterinarian come out and take a look at this foal, and she was concerned about it too. So he's asking me for a second opinion, and I think he was a little too late. So I said, geez, I'm sorry to hear that your foal has died. See you later. But he insisted that I come out and do a, a postmortem, an autopsy on this foal. So reluctantly, I went out there, and he left school, and, and we met right away. And what struck me was, as I walked out into the paddock where this foal was dead, this six-month-old, weanling, he's weanling, he was in a shed. And the shed was loaded with manure so high that as I walked into the set shed and started to walk toward the back of the shed, the manure had risen so high that I couldn't stand up anymore. It, it, was, it, it, it took two feet, three feet away from my height. And, that, and he says, well, I just left the manure in here because I heard that it's a manure pack. And manure packs generate heat. I said, manure packs are moisture. And if you don't believe moisture wicks heat away from anything, you grab a pot holder, get it wet, and go grab something hot in your oven and see how fast your hand burns. Water conducts heat and conducted the heat right away from this foal. And he was cold. He had been weaned from his mare at one and a half, two months old. He had been sent out to a, a horse show. The, the foal had gotten grand champion of the horse show at like four months old. And he brought the foal back. Now look at all the stresses. Weaned way too early, shipped to an environment where other horses were coughing all over him, came back to live in a manure pile that disappeared in the back of the shed. And he was wondering what was wrong. And I said, I took one look. I said, it's parasites. He says, you can't tell me that. I said, yes, all the signs are here. He says, do the autopsy. And so reluctantly, I did the autopsy. And when I got to his intestines, I opened them up, there was no fat, the horse had wasted away, and as I opened it up, you could see the parasites lining inside the, inside the intestines. And I took a section of the intestine, just a small, like a half inch by half inch, and sent it off, and it came back filled with parasites and cells called eosinophils that showed that he was having a reaction to parasites. It was such a sad story to hear this. It's just that people don't understand the importance of stress and the effects that stress can have on horses, their own immune system, and keeping a, a, a place that's filled with manure. And I've talked to people over and over again, and I hear the same thing from a lot of people. They say, oh, you don't understand, Doc. I have three jobs. I don't have time. I can't go out there and pick up all the manure from my paddock. All I can do is just sit there and, and, and deworm them. And I shake my head because they obviously are not taking care of the horses and they're not being the horse's advocate. So I ask you again, how often did your parents deworm you or how often did you deworm yourself or your children? And take that question and apply it to the horses in your paddock. Are you going out there and taking care of those 
uh, horses by cleaning up their field, by keeping them warm in the winter, getting them out of the sun and the flies in the summer, and making them live a life that they normally would have. Because I'll tell you, in the real world, a horse would be eating here and then defecating over there and then eating way over there and then defecating way over there. And in five or seven days, they'd be in the next town over. And when somebody says, I don't want to use chemicals on my horse and I don't have time and I want to do everything natural to a horse, I say to them, take their fence down. And they look at me in shock. I said, the fence is about the most unnatural thing you can do with a horse. And as long as you have a horse that's behind a fence or in a stall, you're obligated to get in there and be the horse's advocate and clean up the environment. So that's my take up points. Clean the environment the best way you can and decrease stress and keep the immune system as positive as, as possible. So that's about it. Um, I'm pretty passionate about parasites. Uh, it's just the way it is. And um, let's see. I got a couple of questions here. First question is, what about resistance? And yes, there, it is true that some horses are becoming resistant to the parasite uh, anthelmintics that we use. And that's what this whole worry is about. So number one, Keep the uh, environment clean. Do your fecal egg counts. Re realize that some of those fecal egg counts are not accurate. They can be zero, and you can still have a uh, fecal problem or uh, parasite problem on your farm. If, you're, if you don't know what's happening on your farm, or if you get any new horse come, that comes on your farm, deworm them once a week for three weeks with ivermectin. Just deworm them once a week for three weeks with ivermectin. Make sure to use the right dose. You know, Don't underdose them. If you give 10 times a dose, like you give a whole tube to a very small mini, you can make them sick. But most horses, if you do one and a half times their body weight with ivermectin, they're just fine. So don't worry about that. It's a very safe drug. Um, and clean these guys out. And never, ever, ever take a new horse that's brought to your property and turn them out where all your other horses go. Clean them up for two weeks. Isolate them. It's called a quarantine. And if you do that, you're going to be able to keep your um, – uh, pad it's clean uh, and when resistance does come you guys are going to be prepared because you now know that the important thing is to keep your environment clean okay does cold or hot weather kill worm eggs and, and the next question do I need to deworm in the winter no parasites are very hardy they can withstand freezing temperatures and they can withstand the hottest of temperatures as long as there's moisture around the only thing that kills parasites is long periods of dry heat. And here in Florida, we'd never have that. And if you're in the Northeast or most part of this country, when snow falls, what it does is it keeps their lips away from where the manure is. And it basically blankets the, the dirty environment so the horse no longer has access to the parasites. But I will tell you that in the wintertime, uh, a lot of the parasites are already internalized. They've gone into cystic stages and then they're hanging out until the daylight gets longer. And that's when they start to migrate and come out again. So no, there's not much ascrid eggs. Ascrid eggs actually stick to the wall of the stall. When they come out, they can stick to anything. They're really weird eggs. They're not like the strong child eggs that crawl up and down grass, but they actually can stick to the wall and a curious fold come along, lick the wall, and bango, he's got the parasite eggs inside of them. And uh, they can last for years. They can last for years in the environment. And I'm not too sure how to clean them up. You can scrub, you can uh, use uh, pressure washers, you do such things like that, keep things clean and make sure the horse has plenty of hay. The foal has plenty of hay when he's grown up so he doesn't start getting curious around the stall wall. And keep him healthy. Trust in the immune system. The immune system will take care of ascrids and most of the parasites that they come into contact to keep him healthy. There's a question of how often do I need to deworm? And I think I pretty much answered that. Uh, I think every six to eight weeks is not often enough. If you really want to uh, stick to the deworming schedule, I'd just say, hey, I've got to listen to Dr. Tucker the first Sunday of every month on horse talk, and I'm going to go out and deworm my horse once, once a month. So couple it up with me if you want. Go out there and deworm them, and then uh, the first Sunday of November, come on back and uh, make sure you deworm your horse again. But I think that's about the furthest I'd go out. I personally think that the daily dewormers do work. Uh, a lot of people are afraid of them. Uh, 
but if you have a large population where you know that your parasite control is in good shape, then the daily dewormers is just a little bit more protection. But daily dewormers do not work in an overwhelming uh, infection. So if you have some new horses that come in and they're just overwhelmed with parasites, daily dewormers will not work for them. Can a horse have a natural immunity to parasites? Absolutely. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that the horse has the ability to knock off a uh, ringworm because the fungus is everywhere. And even though that's not a parasite, it's an immune compromised horse. They can fight off lice. They can fight off a lot of the skin bacterial infections such as rain rot. And they certainly can fight off internal parasites if you keep them healthy. Step one, clean up the environment. Step two, make sure that they're uh, in a, a, a non- crowded environment. Uh, make sure that you're not overfeeding them on grain. Uh, most of you know me know that I don't like grain at all, but that's a whole different subject and I won't get into it tonight. Um, if you're stressing them by going to horse shows, make sure that they have some downtime so they can recuperate, recover, uh, and then deworm once a week for three weeks with ivermectin uh, and get the load out of there and then stay on top of it by deworm once a month if you have to, if you have an environment where you just can't clean it up. Yeah, hold on. Is that? Ah. Oh. Hold on. I got to click something over here. Go to the chat room. Oh, can you recommend a rotation for the North Florida Georgia line region? Um, yeah. Um, it, the rotation thing, again, is uh, you got to keep your chemicals apart. Ivermectin is a whole group of chemicals. Uh, the benzimidazoles are the old classic ones like Panacure and Anthocyte, and uh, there's a couple other ones. They all sound the same. Uh, Strong is a whole other chemical group. Then there's a new group, um, uh, Moxidectin, uh, that can take care of uh, parasites in a really positive way. That's a relatively new drug that they've introduced over the past decade and works very well. Um, and so if you're going to do a rotation and you want to be specific and target, I would definitely um, do a fecal egg count and then ask your veterinarian uh, what specific dewormer they would recommend to target that and get rid of it. There's a new uh, app for your iPhone. Uh, sorry, droid people, but it's for the iPhone where they, you can take a fecal uh, exam, uh, sample and mix it with a uh, solvent and let it sit on a plate and you put an iPhone above this plate and it sits in a, in a brace and you click a picture and the picture of this floating feces in this fluid, uh, the phone has a computer that will identify which the egg larvae are there and will count them and will give you exactly how many eggs of what species are in your horse. It's a really cool thing, it's called eye parasite. I think it's only available for veterinarians I heard about it last winter, about a year ago, and I haven't seen it commercially available yet, but it's coming out, and that's going to make it really easy to detect if you have parasites or not. But again, not all horses are shedders, and if they're not shedding, you're not going to see it coming out. So it's a really tough problem. So to answer your question about how to rotate in that area, uh, my advice is assume that your horse has parasites. Do you worm once a week for three weeks with ivermectin? And I just like that drug. It's very effective still. It cleans things up. And then clean up your pastures. Get your horse away from where they're eating their manure. Lift your hay bales up off the ground. Get them off the ground. Clean up the manure every day, every other day. And you're going to find that rotation is going to be a, an object from the past. And you're going to find that your horse is going to be pretty healthy. All right, well, that's about 48 minutes of jam-packed information about parasites, and I hope that's really covered the gamut. Um, and I'm going to just hang out for another minute or so uh, and talk to you about the horse advocate. If you have any more questions about uh, parasites, um, a lot of this is covered. A lot of this will be covered. The horse advocate is a work in progress. It keeps growing and adding uh, new pictures. It covers things such as parasite control, colic, like last week's, horsemanship, uh, barn construction. Uh, I've got a new section. I've kind of combined breeding and folds together to uh, be called theriogenology, a big uh, name in obstetrics, which basically covers everything from breeding the mare to delivering the foal. So I've got that one. And of course, surgery, how to take care of proud flesh. I've got some really interesting um, 
videos that are put together, uh, photographs, thousands of photographs, literally thousands of photographs, all captioned. So as you roll through them and see these pictures, you can read the captions and learn a lot. Uh, we have sample discussions of topics of horse care, simple discussions, sorry. Um, and, and we put this together with three uh, levels of membership. So you can go to the Horses Advocate, you can try the free tour and take a look at six or so topics and see how I've covered them. Uh, then I have red, yellow, and blue, which gives you specific um, levels of, of uh, connection with me so I can help you become a better horseman and take care of your horses. We also have a private Facebook user group where if you have questions, you can just come there and post it. Only the people who are part of the Horses Advocate, including myself, will have access to this. So you can have a private forum using Facebook, which is really cool. And all that is searchable. So if you get down there and you search parasites, you know anything that's been talked about, parasites will just come up right there on Facebook for you. So that's a really cool place to do it. And we also have some um, other things such as uh, free books. Uh, access to succeed if you want to uh, give something for uh, your horses that are eating grain to prevent colonic ulcers. We've got that. Um, but it's a really cool uh, membership site. So take a look at it. Um, I think we have a, a special that is uh, once a month. So you can get a monthly um, access to it uh, for a while. Just test it out before you commit to an annual membership. And I think that's about it. Anything else that you want me to talk about? Um, yep, no other questions. Well, that's the picture of me that it took years ago. Uh, I still look about the same. Sometimes wear my cowboy hat, sometimes don't. But I want to thank you for your time, for becoming your horse's advocate. And this is Doc T. Wishing you a really good night. And come on back next month, uh, first Sunday of the month, 7 p.m. And I think our topic is. Oh, man, we're falling flat. Uh, I'll have it posted right here where I post the video. I'll say, come to the next one. Um, oh, it's on laminitis. We're going to be talking about laminitis, that inflammation that the horse's feet that causes a lot of pain and, and a lot of confusion and how to prevent it, including insulin resistance, which seems to be the heart and the root of all evil there. And I'll help you through that. So see you uh, Sunday, uh, I think it's November 6th um, at 7 p.m., the first Sunday of November. Thanks, guys. Good night.